Hello, true crimers. This is another worst animal attacks. Viewer discretion is advised. Judy K. Zagorski was born on February 21st, 1953, and she was a Michigan native. She married her high school sweetheart, Steve, and they were married for 33 years. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2005. They had two children and a grandchild. Judy was very outdoorsy. Her and her husband had owned campgrounds, and they just loved camping. They loved boating. She was just someone who was very close with nature. On March 20th, 2008, when she was 55 years old, she was vacationing in the Florida Keys. That day, her and some friends were out just enjoying the ocean. They were out on a boat, just taking in the sights, breathing in the fresh air, observing the sea life. It was kind of a perfect day for Judy, until unfortunately it wasn't. This is a spotted eagle ray. Uh, they can get to be about 16 feet in length and they can have about a 10 foot width with their wingspan. There have been some spotted eagle rays that have gotten up to over 500 pounds. You can even observe them kind of uh, basically jumping out of the ocean and, and seemingly flying. That day in the Florida Keys, as Judy was on a boat with some friends, a spotted eagle ray flew out of the ocean. The boat itself was going about 25 to 30 miles per hour or about 40 kilometers per hour. This particular spotted eagle ray, they would find out later, was about 75 pounds, or 34 uh, kilograms. And this was honestly just a matter of bad timing and wrong place, wrong time. The ray would fly over the boat, and then it connected with Judy. It struck her head, which caused her to fall backwards. The stinger on the ray, which can be pretty long, did actually not sting her. But Judy lie on the floor of the boat now, and she was unconscious. This is an image of that exact ray. Judy had died. They determined that Judy had a fractured skull. That is how hard she was hit by this ray. It fractured her skull. And they ruled her actual cause of death as severe blunt force trauma to her head. An incident like this is extremely rare. I mean, this is the epitome of what a freak accident is. Spotted eagle rays aren't typically a danger to humans. They don't really use their stingers unless it's in defense. But obviously this was just a case of, like I said, just simply a freak accident. I, I believe the ray survived and was put back out into the ocean. It's kind of scary because it just goes to show that there are just some things that we cannot avoid. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of a G.K. Owens. Viewer discretion is advised. Unfortunately, I don't have any other photos, and right now information on this case is very scarce because it literally just happened. I believe it was on June 2nd or June 3rd of 2023. A G.K. Owens, and I do apologize if I said her name incorrectly, uh, she lived in Ocala County in Florida with her four children. The other day, her four kids were out playing with the neighbor kids in the neighborhood, which consisted of a bunch of duplexes. The kids were playing on this patch of grass that was kind of in front of the duplexes, and it was in front of a particular woman's house. This woman has always been a problem. For years, she harasses the kids for playing outside. She's always screaming at them. She has said, like, racist remarks. I don't know the woman's name yet. Uh, I know she's about 60 years old, and she's a white woman. So the other day, the kids are playing, and it was time to go home. When one of her sons got in, he realizes he left his tablet back at that little patch of grass. So he runs back to get it. But when he gets there, it's gone. And that's because the woman who lives in that duplex has always been a problem. She took it. When he asked for it back, she said no. So he goes home, tells his mom. His mom goes down to the house. She knocks on the door and says, hey, come out. You have my property. You have my son's tablet. It's ours. We want it back. The woman basically says nothing. Next thing anyone knows, gunshots are ringing out from somewhere in this house. Ajike is shot. She falls to the ground. From what I understand, the woman shot, I guess, from the sliding glass door portion of her home with intent to shoot her. Neighbors rushed over and tried to help her. They called 911. Unfortunately, Ajike was pronounced dead. The woman inside the house was arrested, apparently questioned, and then she was released that same day. And guess what? No charges were pressed against her. 
She shot and killed a woman. She fired a gun next to children because, yeah, her kids were there to witness it as well as other neighbor kids. So she endangered the lives of children and killed a woman. And as of right now, they're doing nothing about it. It's believed that the woman is going to argue the whole stand your ground thing. But the thing is, is that woman had their property. She stole that tablet and wouldn't give it back. All they were doing is just asking for it back. They weren't harassing. They were knocking on the door. And she got shot and killed for it. So the Ocala police in Florida, they need to take this more seriously. I'm more than happy to call them out. A mother of four is dead because she wanted her son's tablet back. This woman is a constant harasser. She is racist. She shot and killed a woman and endangered the lives of multiple children. Ocala County Police, you need to do something about this right now. Hello, true crimers. I wanted to give you one more update that I'm sure a lot of you have already heard on the murder of Ajika A.J. Owens. In I posted a few videos about her and I know you've seen her story all over the place. So it was confirmed that she was shot directly through the door. As she was standing outside, the shooter was inside and shot through the door. And you can even see the bullet hole right there. And then this is the area uh, basically where it happened. Basically, a very quick summary. The individual who lives in this home has always been a problem in this community. She has been extremely racist. She has harassed everyone in the neighborhood. She had a piece of property that belonged to Ajika Owen's child. She went to go to retrieve that item, and she was shot through the front door for doing so. The person responsible is 58-year-old Susan Lorenz. This is her mugshot. You see, initially she was arrested but released the same day. But I'm hoping, thanks to all of the social media push that I've seen about her story, and this goes to prove the power that social media can have. The 58-year-old woman was arrested again, and she was perp-walked, basically. This is her walk of shame. She was arrested, and she was given multiple charges. She has been charged with manslaughter with a firearm. She was charged with culpable negligence, battery, and two accounts of assault. She also threw a roller skate at one of the children. Not to mention, she fired a gun that killed Ajika, but she fired that gun near children. Now, Susan Lorenz is already basically stating that she was using self-defense uh, by trying to basically put into play the Stand Your Ground law. A law that basically, as some other creators have pointed out as well, that basically lets white people kill black people, you know, because they feel threatened, you know, which was made popular by in the Trayvon Martin case. But again, Susan Lorenz had stolen property, officially, in her presence. All Ajika did was knock on the door and ask for the item back. That's it. And then Susan Lorenz took her gun, she checked her camera or peephole to see who was out there, and then she fired her weapon through the door without even opening it. I have a feeling this, this may get tricky just given that it's in Florida and the whole stand your ground thing, but I really genuinely hope that Ajika Owens and her family, her children, I really sincerely hope that they are awarded the justice that they need to get. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of Almeida Old Crane. Viewer discretion is advised. Unfortunately, I don't really have many photos for this case. But Almeida was part of the Crow tribe, and she lived in Billings, Montana. She would later marry Leo Mascarena, and then the two of them would have three children together. I don't know all of these specifics for this portion, but at one point, sadly, Almeida was sexually assaulted by her own brother. Something that, tragically, her own children witnessed. Not too soon after this, her brother is shot dead. Leo Mascarena, he says he was the one to shoot him, and Leo went to prison. Soon after that, Almeida took to drinking. She became extremely depressed, lost. It was so bad that the kids would end up being put in foster care. It was September 29th, 1981. At 7.50 p.m. on the fifth floor of a parking garage, 
and this is in downtown Billings, Montana, the nude body of 24-year-old Almeida Old Crane was found. She had a single gunshot wound and there was evidence that she was likely sexually assaulted. She was shot with a 25 caliber weapon. The last time anyone can remember seeing her was between 6.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. And she was seen leaving, I guess, the arcade at Empire Bar. Police would come to the conclusion that she was likely taken, sexually assaulted, and then shot and then dumped in this parking garage. Almeida's family, and then later on her children, would come to the thinking that Almeida was likely killed out of some kind of revenge. The kids think that it was one of their cousins who did this. And it's not just the family and you know the, their kids that think this. A lot of people in the community believe it. But no one has come forward with any evidence or proof. It could be because people are scared to come forward. Police did investigate a man that Almeida was apparently seeing at the time since, you know, her husband was in prison and uh, they did look very much into him, his alibi and his whereabouts, but they were able to rule that man out. Any person they investigated, they would eventually rule out as well. They never found the gun that killed her and there's been no other physical evidence ever recovered. No male bodily fluid, no fingerprints, nothing. Many years later, Leo Mascarena would pass away, never knowing what happened to his wife. Her case is still unsolved. If you have any information, please call 406-657-8460. As Native Americans, we're forgotten. They were forgotten. What do you mean by that? Uh, they don't follow up with our, our issues. They don't follow up with are missing. If you're murdered here, missing, they do their search or whatever they need to do and that's it. That's the end of it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Arden Pepion. Viewer discretion is advised. Arden Pepion was born on September 5th, 2017. She was born to Arbana and Aaron Pepion and they lived in Browning, Montana. And Arden and her family were members of the Blackfeet tribe. On April 22nd, 2021, Arden was out with her uncle named Hahax VA. I am very sorry if I said the name wrong. And his girlfriend, Kimberly Higgins. The three of them were near the Two Medicine River. And I guess the uncle and the girlfriend were there just hanging out with Arden. And I guess they were practicing shooting. Now, at one point, the uncle went to reload his gun. And when he said he looked back up, uh, Arden was just gone. So he and his girlfriend began searching the area when they noticed her, I guess, boot prints, because she was wearing these little boots, um, walking towards the direction of the river. But they couldn't find Arden anywhere. They searched for a long time, and it took them five to six hours to actually report her missing to authorities. So once police got involved, the family came out there and everyone's starting to search. They do find her boot prints. Eventually they find one of her boots near the actual river, but they've never found Arden. There are members on the Blackfeet Reservation who believe that police weren't doing their due diligence or weren't doing as much as they should, you know, given that this is an indigenous little girl that's missing. So the family and people, uh, the Blackfeet tribe, they began to search themselves. You know, they are combing the river, they're combing the, the banks of the river, but they have never found her anywhere. No more of her belongings had been found. Arden was wearing a gray sweatshirt and it had the word glacier written across the front. And also black leggings with black boots, which one of them was found. The boot was found in the water itself. She has brown hair, brown eyes, and both of her ears are pierced. And she goes by the nickname Artie. Now, soon afterwards, the uncle and his girlfriend were both charged uh, with connection to this case. This was due to very poor supervision and neglect. I mean, yeah. So he was, the uncle was charged with child neglect and negligent endangerment. He pled guilty and got a nine month suspended sentence and house arrest. The charges against the girlfriend were dropped. Sadly, about a year or so after Arden disappeared, her mother passed away of natural causes, I believe. If you have any information, please contact the Blackfeet Tribal Law Enforcement. Do any of these age progression photos resemble either yourself or someone you know? 
because this individual was kidnapped in 1997. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Austin Cole Hernandez. Viewer discretion is advised. Austin Hernandez was born on June 10th, 1996. These are a few photos of Austin's father. His name is Gilbert Arredondo Hernandez. Now, he was actually Austin's non-custodial father. Basically, he did not have custody of Austin through the courts. Now, at the time of this story, he resembled this picture right here. He was about 32 years old. Austin's mother, Rhonda Accord, said that he was living with her and Austin, and he was not a good guy. Uh, he threatened to harm Rhonda all the time. He threatened to leave her and take Austin. And that appears to be exactly what he did. It was April 28th, 1997, and this was in Tehachapi, California. Rhonda had gone out, and that meant that Austin was home alone with his father. When Rhonda got home, both Gilbert and Austin were gone. It is believed that Gilbert kidnapped the 10-month-old baby and left somewhere. Gilbert at the time was driving a brown 1986 Nissan Maxima. The license plate number was 1NRE732. They believe he may have taken Austin either to Las Vegas, Nevada, or possibly Los Angeles, California. But this was also way back in 1997. And at this point, they could be anywhere. Now the FBI and the Kern Sheriff's Department, and that's in the Bakersfield, California area, they are asking for the public's help again. They don't know if Austin was harmed or if Gilbert took him and they lived normally from that point moving forward. So again, this is what Gilbert would have possibly looked like around that time. This is a, wow, this is an age progression photo of what Gilbert may look like today or around this time. Gilbert would be approximately 58 years old. He has a scar on the back of his head and sometimes goes by Gil Jr. These are several age progression photos of what Austin may look like over the years. Austin would be approximately 26 years old today. So if by chance maybe Austin recognizes himself, recognizes his own father, or if anyone out there has recognized someone who looks like this, please contact the FBI or the Kern Sheriff's Department at 661-861-3110. Hello, true crimeers. There is an update on the William Tyrell case. I have received a few messages and uh, comments uh, with regards to this. So thank you to all of you who have sent those. So if you click the comment, you'll go back to the original video I made, which was actually back in 2021. But a very brief recap. In 2014, three-year-old William Tyrell, literally just moments after this photo was taken, and this was in New South Wales in Australia, well, he seemed to just vanish. Now, I do want to clarify that unfortunately, even to this very day, it's June of 2023, his body has still not been recovered. But the news is that police allege William Tyrell's foster mum covered up death and they are now seeking charges. So basically, they are recommending charges to the prosecution, um, alleging that the foster mother is responsible basically for disposing of his body. They allege that she covered up his accidental death, which this is now almost a decade ago. Um, by the way, for, I guess, legal reasons there in Australia, her identity is not allowed to be released publicly. So any photo of her uh, is blurred out. So I guess a strike force team was set up to uh, secretly investigate this. They came to the conclusion that William likely died in a tragic accident. They believe that the mother then covered up his death by dumping his body in a bushland near the home. But like I said, even after they've searched that area, they have not recovered his body to at this point. They said that we aren't guessing, we aren't bluffing, we are saying we know what happened and why it happened and where his body is. But then the foster mom would say, well, then why haven't you got him? Which is a valid question. You know, they are alleging they know where he is, but they haven't found his remains yet. 
Now, this was, like I said, about 10 years ago, so a lot of things could have happened to his remains in that time frame. There are animals that could have gotten to him. Over the course of that decade, a lot of, I'm sure, tumultuous storms and, and weather incidences have occurred that could have, you know, maybe taken his body somewhere else. Now, it should also be said that as of this video, June 27th, 2023, charges have not been actually pressed against her yet. They are just recommending charges be placed on her. The prosecution, as hopefully would any prosecution, they need to be able to look at all the facts and evidence this team has collected and say, yes, we can reasonably prosecute her and we could get a conviction from this evidence. So they have to assess all of that information they have now, and then they will determine if they will actually be pressing charges against her. So there will still be more updates on this case. Spontaneous human combustion would be one of the scariest and worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was 67-year-old Mary Reeser. She was born on March 8, 1884. At the time that this story takes place, Mary is living at the Alamanda Apartments in St. Petersburg, Florida. It was 8 o'clock in the morning on July 2nd, 1951. Mary's landlord would go to Mary's apartment to knock on the door, and no one answered. She then tried the doorknob, and it felt very hot to the touch. Suspecting there may be a fire, she calls the police. When firefighters get access into the apartment, they see something that they have never seen before. I cannot show you all of the images, but in a corner of her apartment, there was a chair at that time. The chair was basically crumbled. There was a bunch of ashes on the ground. I cannot show you all of it, but in the ash, they found a foot. As they sifted through the ash, they find a spine and a skull. But that is it. That is all they find. Eventually, they would somehow identify the remains as that belonging to Mary Reeser. All that was left of her was a left foot, a spine, and a skull. What is more bizarre about this than it already is, is that the fire seemed to be contained just to that one corner of the apartment. Just where Mary was sitting. There was virtually no damage to the rest of the apartment. There was no smoke damage. Most of the furniture was completely intact with no damage whatsoever. Not scorched or anything. Mary Reeser was referred to as the Cinder Lady. For quite some time, she was referred to as a victim of spontaneous human combustion. That she was just sitting in her chair and she just caught on fire. They found no actual source of the fire. They could not determine the origin. Eventually, the FBI would become involved, and they would say that their conclusion was that Mary died of the wick effect. Mary smoked cigarettes. She also took sleeping pills. So they theorized that she had fallen asleep while smoking a cigarette, and sitting on the chair. The ground was made of cement. The chair was pushed away from the walls, and that's why only the chair burned. The fat from her body, any human body, acted as fuel, and she slowly burned to death. So badly that somehow, Mary turned to ash. In the early morning hours of April 22nd, 2018, CCTV would capture the exact moment a mass shooting began. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of the Nashville Waffle House shooting. Viewer discretion is advised. This was 20-year-old Joe Perez Jr. He had recently moved to Nashville, Tennessee from Texas. He moved to Texas so that he could help his brother with his new business. Sometime around 3 o'clock in the morning on April 22nd, 2018, Joe found himself just outside this Waffle House in the Antioch neighborhood of Nashville, Tennessee. Also there that same morning was 29-year-old Torian Sanderlin. Torian was described as a big, happy guy. Someone who would always meet a person with a big, warm hug. Torian loved to cook. He loved taking care of animals. He was a gentle giant. 
he was an employee of the Waffle House. This was 23-year-old Aquila Da Silva. Aquila worked as an audio engineer and videographer, and he was an aspiring rapper, and his stage name was Natrix Dream. He was there that morning at the Waffle House with his brother Abadi and also his girlfriend. And then this was 21-year-old Deebony Groves. She was from Gallatin, Tennessee. She was majoring in social work and attended Belmont University. She was a theme park enthusiast, and she loved riding on roller coasters with her brother. That particular morning, she was inside the Waffle House. This is footage from about 3.21 in the morning. Everything was normal. Everything was calm. Business as usual. But then at 3.23 a.m., everything changed. You can see in this image that there is smoke coming from the window. This is the exact moment someone began to open fire towards the restaurant. Joe Perez Jr., he was standing outside the Waffle House when a man who was completely nude except for a jacket, armed with an AR-15, fired at him. Sadly, these were fatal gunshots. Joe would die there on the spot. The shooter then entered inside the restaurant and began to fire more rounds. He had also shot one person outside that survived, but then continued to shoot people inside where three more people would lose their lives. Joe Perez Jr., Torian Sanderlin, Aquila Da Silva, and Deebony Groves were the fatalities. Another individual was shot through the head, but actually would end up surviving. And a couple more people had like shots through their arms, their legs, but would survive. Torian at one point tried to charge the shooter to get the gun away from him. And that is how unfortunately he got shot. He was trying to save people. This is an image of the shooter inside the restaurant. Moments after he had shot several people, another man uh, attempted to intervene. Caught on camera, James Shaw Jr., who was an electrician in the area, would wrestle with the shooter. He would fight him and he slammed him at one point into the window. And James Shaw Jr. was able to actually take the AR-15 out of the shooter's hands. He even, he grabbed it by the muzzle and he burned his hands pretty severely. And then he threw the gun uh, behind the counter. This then led to the shooter running away. And for a little while, they did get away. This is James Shaw Jr., an absolute hero. Using nothing but his hands, he stopped the shooter from continuing to murder more people. An incredibly brave thing to do. In the aftermath, James Shaw Jr. was showered with praises, with awards. He was interviewed on, you know, talk shows, and he deserved every moment of it. A manhunt began for the shooter. About 34 hours after it happened, uh, a construction worker would call police to say they saw a nude white male run into the woods and he appeared to have a gun on him. And he kind of matched the description of the Waffle House shooter. So police found him and it was this man, Travis Ranking. This was the moment where this monster was apprehended. Travis Ranking was originally from Illinois. He always had issues with, with mental health concerns, uh, suffering from paranoia, delusion, possibly schizophrenia. One time he called police because he was convinced Taylor Swift was stalking him and that she was hacking his uh, devices. He also claimed that he was going to marry Taylor Swift, but then also said he was gay, which was not true. He was arrested in 2017 trying to cross into the White House lawn because he wanted to set up a meeting with President Trump. He was fired from jobs shortly before the shooting took place, saying that people and the government and all this were after him. So after the arrest, he was ordered to see psychiatrists and they diagnosed him with actually being schizophrenic. And then the judge ruled that he was not competent to stand trial. But then that changed a little while later. He was then found competent to stand trial by 2022, which is when his trial began. He tried to plead guilty by reason of insanity, but it didn't work. The jury found him guilty of all charges, and he would be sentenced to life in prison without parole. How did he get the guns, by the way? Well, after the White House situation, his guns were taken away from him, and his license was revoked in Illinois. The state didn't take the guns away, though. The state ordered his father to remove the guns but his father gave him the guns back. <laughs> and then this happened. 
In true crime news, that's sure to set off some feelings of some overly sensitive people in the comments below. This walking, talking pubic hair was indicted today. Yeah, grand jury indicts Daniel Penny in chokehold death of Jordan Neely. Good! Neely's death was ruled a homicide, according to the medical examiner. Well, we all knew that part. The precise charges apparently won't be unsealed until his next court appearance, but it is believed that they are um, manslaughter charges. On May 1st, 2023, Daniel Penny, which sounds like a butler in a porn movie, put Jordan Neely in a chokehold on the subway. Some witnesses to the event said that Jordan Neely was yelling and harassing passengers. But police sources told ABC News that Penny was not specifically being threatened by Neely when he intervened, and that Neely had not become violent and had not been threatening anyone in particular. But Kroger brand Miss Frizzle here decided to take it into his own hands instead of getting the law involved to just put uh, Mr. Neely in a chokehold. He held him in that chokehold until Mr. Neely was no longer moving, and then he continued to hold the chokehold, which then led to his death. The cause of death was the chokehold itself, and that's when the coroner ruled it a homicide. So they did a very thorough investigation. They conducted several and tons of interviews with direct witnesses. They also had the video footage of the event. And that's why the grand jury was able to actually indict him. This indictment should show that nobody is above the law. If this individual was being a threatening individual, which by many witnesses he was not, perhaps get the law that you guys all love so much involved first before killing the person. No, it's just, uh, he was making some people uncomfortable. He was yelling, so just, we'll kill him and then we'll just, we'll ask questions later. And we'll probably get away with it, you know. We as normal citizens are not judge, jury, and executioner. You know, I can maybe understand if he was waving a gun around and pulling the trigger and firing off rounds. But, uh, Jordan Neely was just using his words. And words aren't weapons. They're not, they're not ammunition. He wasn't actually physically harming anyone. If someone is causing some sort of ruckus and maybe you do feel threatened, there are ways of maybe restraining a person first. Instead of wrapping your arm around their throat and squeezing as tight as possible, causing them to lose, you know, their airflow. There were other options to restrain him if he was a problem. But no. Just kill him. We'll get away with it later. Really, it just goes to show how fragile some people are. That they are so scared of words. And they are so scared of people who are maybe a little different. Jordan Neely did suffer from mental health issues. But we don't kill people for having mental health issues. At the very least, let's get the law involved first. Rotten hell. A man walks into a bar with hatred in his heart and he attempts a massacre. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Danny Overstreet. Viewer discretion is advised. Danny Lee Overstreet... He was born on February 14th, 1957, and he was born in Bedford, Virginia. Danny was a gay man. He was a hairdresser. Danny was described as joyful, had an infectious laugh, and he did impressions, and one of his best was an impression of Phyllis Diller. He was described as lovable and nothing short of a sweetheart. His friends said that even if a stranger walked up and said, hey, I needed help moving some stuff, Danny would get his pickup truck and go help that stranger in a heartbeat. He was a wonderful man, but his life ended when he was 43 years old. It was September 22nd, 2000. Police arrive at the Backstreet Cafe at 11.51 p.m. The Backstreet Cafe uh, was a popular gay hangout spot and it was located in Roanoke, Virginia. Police arrived because there were multiple calls of shots fired. Sometime around 11.40ish p.m., an older gentleman walked into the cafe, walked up to the bar and ordered a drink. That man then walks towards the entrance and with his back to everyone in the bar, reaches behind and pulls out a nine millimeter. He then turns around and he fires eight shots. Seven people total are hit with bullets. Everyone was running for cover. They were ducking, they were hiding. Suddenly there was blood everywhere. One man was shot in his stomach and he survived. One woman had her fingers shot off. The man just turns around and calmly walks out. When police arrive, uh, six of the seven people are still alive and they would all end up surviving. However, 43-year-old Danny Overstreet was deceased. 
Police went on the immediate hunt for his killer. Yep, that fits the bill. Ten minutes after they arrive on scene, they find an older gentleman on his own. He's away from the bar. He said to them, I just came from that F slur bar and I blew him away. About 30 minutes prior to the shooting, he was at a different location where he told an employee there, I want to go waste some F slurs. And then he even showed the person his gun, but the person didn't do anything thinking that he was joking. Police arrest this man. Do you know what his name is? I shit you not. Ronald Gay. Oof. He hated gay people. He had a lot of resentment for his own last name. He had been ridiculed his whole life about his last name, but it's not known if that's why he hated gay people or not, but he did, he hated them. He pled guilty to first degree murder and he got life in prison without parole. He died in prison in January of 2022. They knew exactly who killed Sonic Gary, but it would take them 30 years to finally put them away. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of Gary Kurgan. Viewer discretion is advised. Gary Kurgan was born on May 1st, 1950. By the time this story takes place, he is a happily married 34-year-old businessman. Gary and his brother Ted were in business together. They owned restaurants. Specifically, they had bought into the Sonic, you know, drive-ins. And Gary knew that Sonic was going to become this booming business. Now, in the 80s, Gary and his brother and their business partner, they were basically on the verge of acquiring a bunch of stores in the Louisiana area. So Gary and one of their business partners would get an apartment in Baton Rouge while all of this negotiation was going on. By late November 1984, Gary had finally secured the funding to go forward with this process. It was going to be a huge step. Gary was described as kind of a flashy guy. He liked to drive around his a Cadillac and he wore like, you know, flashy jewelry. But he was also very humble at the same time. On November 28th, 1984, Gary called his brother Ted with the big news and he said, hey, I'm on my way to your apartment now. Gary also told their business partner, hey, I'm going to Ted's place now. Gary never got there. Gary was now missing. His brother Ted immediately went searching for him, and when he couldn't find him, he reported him missing to police. While the police were doing their thing, Ted was also investigating himself. Their business partner told Ted that there was a crumpled up note in their apartment, the apartment that Gary lived in. The note had the name Erica on it and a phone number. Ted was a little concerned because, you know, Gary's a very faithful husband. Why does he have another woman's phone number? At any rate, Ted did some digging. He found out Erica was actually uh, someone who worked at a local strip club. So Ted goes to that strip club and finds out that Erica is not her real name. Erica was actually a 19-year-old stripper and sex worker. Her real name was Layla Mulla. Layla Mulla was dating someone twice her age, and his name was Ronald Dunnigan. Ted found out that the last person to likely see his brother was Layla. So he informed police, and he, along with police, they went to the apartment that Layla and Ronald shared together. What they found inside was, well, bloody. There was blood everywhere. I mean, it was not even hidden. <laughs> it was also on the carpets. It looked like a struggle had taken place. But Gary was nowhere inside this apartment. His car was also missing. Well, that is until the very next day. They found Gary's brand new Cadillac in a parking lot. And when they opened the trunk, well, it wasn't looking so good. In the trunk was a thick layer of blood. And the items in the trunk had blood on them. This was enough blood to say, whoever was in here is no longer alive. However, the family did not know Gary's blood type. This was also before DNA testing was a thing. So they could not say the blood in the car and the blood in the apartment was Gary's. They did also find a diary written by Layla, and it had this drawing in it with like trees and trash, and it looked like a burial site, but it had no address and there was no way of knowing where this was. The diary also had hit Gary next time. There is a plan to get him next time. 100%, this all appeared that Layla and Ronald had done something to Gary, but Gary's body was nowhere to be found. They could not link the blood to Gary. The diary entries did not say that they had killed Gary. 
just that maybe implying they planned to rob him. So they were temporarily arrested, but because the DA had no physical evidence to say for certain that Gary was murdered and that they had done it, they had to let him go. Holy shit. Oof. Fast forward 30 years later, Gary's brother Ted never stopped thinking about this case. He was determined to get these two in prison. Layla, uh, she would eventually become a registered nurse in New York. And Ronald, well, he turned into that. So, a cold case team began to work on this case. They took all of that blood evidence that they had collected. Now, in 2012-13, police got a blood sample from Gary's son, Wade. And they were able to then say that the blood in the trunk and the blood in the apartment was Gary Kurgan's blood. Now, it links all of it to these two directly. Then when you put in with the diary entries, you know, all the circumstantial evidence, now you have enough to arrest and indict. But Layla, she would confess to police in order to secure herself a deal, and she was given 30 years in prison. Ronald was basically her pimp. Gary had always visited her at the strip club, paid her lots of money. He was kind of infatuated with her. He wore expensive jewelry. He drove a really fancy new Cadillac. They figured he's got money. So the plan was for them to rob him. And they lured him to their apartment where Ronald poisoned Gary until he died. And then Layla said Ronald cut his body into pieces, which is why there was blood everywhere. They then threw the body parts in random dumpsters. Gary's body has never been found. So he would go to trial and get convicted. He got life in prison without parole. Layla would then tell them this wasn't about robbery. She confessed this was a thrill kill. They wanted to know what it was like to kill someone. And Gary was their unlucky victim. Hang on, everybody. Okay. It's the train. Oh, God. We're going down. Ah! Calm down, Bethany. Jesus. Bethany's a screamer. <laughs> we're done. Uh, hello, true crimers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Today's story takes us to Silver Dollar City, a 61-acre theme park located in Branson, Missouri. It opened in May of 1960, and it is a very, very popular place to go. One of the most popular rides they have there is an indoor roller coaster named Fire in the Hole. It opened in 1972. It can reach a top speed of 35 miles per hour, or 56 kilometers per hour. Basically, you board these little trains and you go along this indoor track. And it has a few drops, drops about 20 to 30 feet or so. Now, I'm filming this video on June 27th, 2023, and I had read that this ride, the most popular ride they have, is actually closing this year. But 43 years ago, it had a very deadly accident. 23-year-old James Frederick Polly, photo I cannot find, he and his wife and I believe some other friends and family were there at Silver Dollar City, and this was July 9th, 1980. They got on fire in the hole, and the roller coaster, which lasts about three minutes or so, uh, went as planned. But then, an accident happened at the very, very end. Roller coasters like this will have a maintenance bay, and then the tracks will change so they can take the empty cars into the maintenance bay, while the cars with people on it will continue about to the end of the ride. Well, for whatever reason, there was a mechanical error the train that James and 14 others were on somehow got switched over to the maintenance track. They don't know exactly how fast the train was going, but probably somewhere in the 20 to 25 mile range. When it was going into the maintenance bay, there is a low hanging door because it's not meant for people to pass through. When one of the operators noticed what was happening, he screamed to everyone, duck, duck, duck. And everyone did, but James did not, or he did not duck fast enough his head slammed into this low-hanging metal door. And it was a high enough speed that it caused him to basically go unconscious. And when emergency services arrived, it was too late. James was pronounced dead at the scene. 
he suffered from severe blunt force trauma. To my knowledge, nobody was held responsible. Hello, true crimers. I'm sure the majority of you have already seen this information and already know the outcome, but just in case, to those who do not know, the uh, search for the missing five people on the Titan submarine is over. They announced, I think it was earlier this morning, um, that they had found debris um, in the area where the submarine would have possibly gone, you know, missing. And then they held a press conference not too long ago. And they have announced officially that the Titanic sub passengers have died due to catastrophic pressure implosion. From what I've seen people uh, talk about in terms of like the science behind this, uh, it's very, very likely that the five men aboard the sub probably weren't even aware that they were in danger. That the implosion is basically, it's so sudden and so instantaneous that their deaths were very likely also instantaneous. I remember watching, I used to love watching Mythbusters and I remember this episode where I th they did something to like a, a tanker thing. Uh, and this is basically what they showed. So this is what an implosion would look like. Now it won't be identical to probably what happened with this since this one's underwater and it's a smaller, it's a different shape, but just so you have an understanding of what it looks like. So that's uh, obviously uh, very terrifying. That would be something I would call a worse death than manageable if it's something they actually felt. But there's really no way of knowing. I have read that they said there probably won't even be uh, remains to even find. The passengers did sign waivers. They knew what they were getting into. They knew what this was. You know, they... I would hope have knew about the construction of this thing and all of the I just, I, I just don't understand how anyone would ever trust this I don't get it I don't understand like I'm claustrophobic as it is so you're, you're not ever putting me in a tube like that but like even if I wasn't and I saw this I would be no like I'm not getting in that <laughs> And then they rivet it shut so it's sealed. So you you they you can't get out of it until someone opens it. There's just so much, so much wrong with this thing. And clearly, it's it, this is proof. The dude who made this thing, oof. I don't expect this to end well for him financially, probably. Um, about that, there. There won't, there won't be bodies. Uh, there will not be any bodies to find. There will be probably no remains uh, to find or, or see. They were two miles deep in the ocean and basically were in a, a submarine made of paper mache and cardboard at this point. So an implosion, they're just, they're just gone. They're gone. The amount of pressure and the fact that they, they just, just, I, I have no other way to put it. Just this, there won't be anything left. By the way, my last video, I said the owners were to pay for something. I had a brain fart and I forgot he was on the damn thing. So he, he did pay for it, technically. But yeah, no, there won't be anything to find. So there is some news on the Titan submersible, uh, which we all know imploded with five men on board. Well, apparently they have recovered some of the debris from the imploded submersible. But here's what's really confusing me. They say debris and presumed human remains from lost Titan are recovered. Presumed human remains. I did not think that was going to even be remotely possible. However, what exactly those remains are, they did not specify. Um, the only thing it says is that the United States medical professionals will conduct a formal analysis of presumed human remains that have been carefully recovered within the wreckage at the site of the incident. Within the wreckage. My brain is thinking that just means there are pieces of them to be as, uh, that's graphic, I'm sorry, 
like caked onto the walls of the debris like you know blood and i'm assuming some form of solid mass um stuck to the walls so i guess more on that to come maybe i'm just blown away they had anything uh they said they have appeared to have the titan's 22 foot hull crinkled and twisted with exposed wires and cables so this is one piece there that they've recovered and then there's more underneath this tarp this i believe is what they're referring to as the cables and cords and stuff all tangled up and just completely smushed and then they have this piece which looks like it's a flattened piece completely um there on the back of that truck so i guess what they found are parts of the tail cone the front end bell and the nose cone and the debris was covered within 500 meters of the titanic's wreck so i guess they're going to be investigating the cause of the implosion uh, they have no timeline for that, for those efforts, but they said it could take between 18 to 24 months to conclude their investigation. I mean, they put five people in a sardine can the size of a van and dumped them into the deepest parts of the ocean and the sub imploded. There's your investigation. Like, I don't understand why they need to waste time and energy and resources on this. I don't get it. We all know what happened. It imploded. Five people who knew exactly what they were getting themselves into. Five people who signed a waiver basically saying, yeah, you could die from this. Very good chance you will. And it imploded because it was a poorly built submersible. There you go. There's your investigation done. I just don't know why they need to waste any more time and energy on investigating this. But that's me. He didn't realize who he was flirting with, so... He felt he needed to kill her. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Islan Nettles. Viewer discretion is advised. Islan Rose Nettles was born on October 10th, 1991. And she was born and raised in New York, and that's where she spent her whole life. Islan wanted to become a fashion designer, and she was going to school for that. She was creative. She was vibrant. She was a person. By 2012, Islan had begun to transition um, and she had come out as transgender to her friends, her family, and everyone in her life seemed to be incredibly accepting. On August 17th, 2013, sometime after midnight, and this was in, I guess, the Harlem area, um, Islan was just walking down the street when a man began to kind of do, you know, catcalling and started flirting with her. He approached her and he tried to talk to her and again he just kept flirting and then Islan had said listen I'm you know I'm transgender and well that set him off. The man punched her just right in the face and then he punched her again until she collapsed to the ground. He then continued to pummel her and beat her face until she was no longer recognizable. He beat her so viciously that she completely was just gone. And then he just left her in just a bloody mess on the ground and ran away. An ambulance was called and she was rushed to the hospital and had to be put on life support. And then unfortunately, five days later, she would pass away. She never woke up, by the way. The attack happened right across the street from a police station. It seemed to take some time though to kind of figure out who did this. Eventually, this man here, 25 year old James Dixon, would eventually confess to doing it. This actually took years. They did have one other person in custody who was there. They initially charged that person with like assault, but then they dropped charges altogether. And they never had a case to build up against anyone until he came forward and basically said it was him. He said once he found out that Islan was transgender, well, he said he needed to protect his manhood. He needed to be a man because people were making fun of him for now flirting with a transgender person. He said, I have no issues against them, but my manhood. He would plead guilty to manslaughter and he was sentenced to just 12 years. No hate crime charges. She wasn't being deceitful. James was a monster. A young girl was supposed to be on her way to school 
but unfortunately, she will now be seven years old forever. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Deborah Palmer. Viewer discretion is advised. Deborah Ann Palmer was born on February 27th, 1990, and she was actually born in the Philippines. But when she was still a baby, the family would pick up and move to the States. Specifically, they moved to the Oak Harbor area in Washington State. Deborah's father really wasn't a part of her life. As a matter of fact, he would be in jail um, at the time this case happened. By the time she was seven years old, she loved movies like Aladdin and Pocahontas. She said when she grew up, she wanted to be a supermodel or maybe even an actress. Everyone described her as a very sweet young girl. She was very smart and she was incredibly self-reliant. She would even go to church on her own. Someone says she was a pretty precocious little girl for her age and that she was just super wise beyond her years. It was March 26th, 1997, and she was seven years old. That morning, she was getting ready to go to school. She attended Oak Harbor Elementary School. Her 11-year-old cousin was going to pick her up from the house and walk with her to the school. When her cousin got there, Deborah still wasn't ready for school, so the cousin just said, all right, I'm gonna go on my own then, and he did. And Deborah said, I'll walk to school on my own. But Deborah never got to school. Deborah was never seen alive again. Not but a couple of hours later, once the school notified her mother that she didn't show up to school, Deborah was reported missing. The Oak Harbor police get involved. They start searching everywhere for her. And then the community joins in. Over the next couple of days, they find like pieces of her belongings, like her backpack and whatnot. And then sadly, five days after she went missing, she was found. She was found near the Strawberry Point area of Oak Harbor Beach. She had been wedged under some logs and the water was just above her. They don't know if Deborah was washed up on shore or if she was put there. The coroner said there were no physical signs of sexual assault, but they couldn't say if she wasn't or not. Her cause of death was asphyxiation. They said she wasn't like strangled with someone's hands, that it was done by something. Deborah's mom, um, she put a lot of blame on herself. She said she was very much into the party scene during all that time and felt that maybe she wasn't as much of a presence in Deborah's life as she could have been. But she didn't kill her child. A monster did. And to this day, the identity of that monster remains unknown. They have been able to rule people out, like people like her close family. And they said they've had persons of interest over the years, but never a suspect. They were hoping that with technology evolving, like with, you know, touch DNA, maybe they can get more evidence, but so far nothing. If you have information on Deborah Palmer's murder, call 1-800-222-TIPS. Her death was initially ruled an accident, but just the other day, police made an arrest for murder. Hello, true crimers. This is the missing or murdered indigenous woman case of Destiny Lloyd. Viewer discretion is advised. Destiny Louise Lloyd was 23 years old at the time of this case, and she lived on the Yakima Reservation. The Yakima Reservation rests here in the state of Washington. Now, Destiny worked in childcare, and she did so at the Legends Casino Hotel in Toppenish. She was really good with kids. She always took care of her nieces, her nephews, her younger cousins, and she could have made a wonderful mother down the road. But she never got that chance. The last time anyone can recall seeing Destiny alive was on Christmas Day 2017. And then suddenly, like that, she vanished. Nowhere to be found. The reservation was searched. They searched outside of it as well. And sadly, roughly four days later, they would find her. Her body was found on the Yakima Reservation in a very, like, rural, desolate area. The coroner initially ruled that she died from a basal skull fracture, and they listed it as an accident, that she probably fell and hit her the back of her head on a rock. But then, about a year later or so, they were able to get a second autopsy done. They then determined that this was not an accident, that she died of blunt force trauma to the back of her head, that she was likely struck with something like a large metal pole, a wooden pole, something of that line. But then even with that, the case still went cold. They looked into anyone who may have been an enemy to her and they didn't find anyone. They questioned her friends, her family, her acquaintances, and for a long time, they come up with nothing. And then finally, just the other day, June 21st, 2023. 
Police announced they have arrested two people in connection to her murder. There are no photos of these two individuals yet, but a woman named Tashina Sam, she was arrested and charged with first degree murder. And then a second individual, a man named Waylon Jake Napier, he was charged with something called misprision of a felony. Basically he knew about the murder, but did nothing about it. He didn't report the crime. The investigation concluded that Tashima, sometime on December 26, 2017, in an attempt to rob Destiny, struck her in the back of the head with a metal pipe and then dumped her body and really wasn't able to rob much of anything. They also determined that it was premeditated. These are federal charges. There are trial dates set for August of 2023, but that could change. But at least Destiny and her family are getting the justice they deserve have died in some unusual ways over the course of history. Hello, true crimeers. This is eight stories of people who died in unusual ways. Viewer discretion is advised. The first story happened in the Netherlands in 2017. The victim's name was Hadir Korkmaz. Hadir was a drug dealer. He was also set to testify against a drug kingpin. He, of course, feared for his life, but it wasn't Hitman who took him out. One morning he was out fishing, and when he cast his line, the hook hit an electricity pole. It immediately sent shocks to his body, and he was electrocuted to death. The next story is officially the oldest one I've ever told. This happened in Austria in 1567, back when I was a senior in high school. Hans Steininger, who was a mayor there in Austria, well, he had a very large beard. It went all the way below his feet. One day, a fire broke out in his home. He was rushing out of his house when he tripped over his own beard. He fell down a staircase and died. Immediately, no. No. Nope. The next one happened in San Francisco in 1854. A 13-year-old boy named William Snyder was working at a circus. He was passing out, you know, snacks to people. When all of a sudden, a circus clown who was just trying to be silly grabbed William by his ankles and began to swing him around. It caused a ruptured artery in William's lungs. And unfortunately, he died from this. It was a death by a clown. Mm. The next story happened in Vienna, 1867. This was the Archduchess Matilda of Austria. Her father had a no smoking policy in their house. So one day she was smoking, her father walked in. Oops, she was about to get caught. So she put the cigarette behind her back. The cigarette caught her dress on fire. The dress was made of gauze. Her entire body was then suddenly engulfed in flames and she died. The next story happened in the UK, 1924. The victim's name was Thornton Jones. He was a lawyer when all of a sudden he woke up and his throat had been cut by a razor. While his family was trying to help him, he asked for a pen and paper. He wrote down, I dreamt that I did it to myself. And then he wrote, and I awoke to find it true. He survived for another 80 minutes before he passed away. They ruled it suicide with temporary insanity. The next story happened in France, 1927. The victim's name was Isadora Duncan. She was a well-beloved dancer. She loved wearing scarves. One day she was riding in the backseat of her vehicle when her long scarf kind of flew out from the wind. The scarf got caught in the back tire and it dragged her out, slamming her into the ground while the car was still going and it broke her spine, which caused her to die. The next story happened in England in 1881. The victim's name was Sir William Payne Galway. Well, one day he was out hunting and he was near a field of turnips. He appeared to have slipped on one of the turnips and then he landed on a turnip. This caused him to have several blunt force trauma injuries. And believe it or not, it would lead to his death just a few days later. Fucking vegetables. Our final story happened in Egypt, 1923. The victim's name was Lord Carnivon. At some point prior to this incident taking place, Lord Carnivon was bitten by a mosquito. Well, within a day or so, he was shaving and his razor accidentally sliced into the mosquito bite. This actually caused an infection and the infection would lead to his death. Lord Carnivon was also someone who was involved in opening King Tut's tomb. Something they say that you would be cursed if you did so. 
So, of course, those who wrote about the story of his death said it was not a mosquito bite that killed him, but it was a curse. A man would be doused in sulfuric acid and left to die in a parking lot. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Rudy Huda. Viewer discretion is advised. Leonard Rudolph Huda, who would go by Rudy to everyone, he was born in September of 1936 in Chicago, Illinois. He served in the U.S. Air Force, where he was a captain. He would end up marrying the love of his life, Edith. And then the two of them would settle down in Lauderdale-by-the-Sea, which is in Florida. He would become the manager of a resort called Souders Resort, and life was going great. At 3.22 p.m. on July 9th, 2000, 911 was called. A man was lying on the street next to his vehicle, and he was in agony, and it looked like his skin was burning. When EMS arrived, they rushed him to the hospital, and it was evident to them that this man had been covered in sulfuric acid. And then witnesses from the parking lot said they saw someone running up to this man with a bucket and throwing um, liquid onto this man. And then they fled in a white pickup truck. The victim was identified as 63-year-old Rudy Huda. He was in a coma and he never woke up. He suffered from severe burns all over his body. He then had multiple organs fail and then he had sepsis. 11 days after the incident, he died. Police initially look to his wife, Edith, because usually it's the spouse who does it. They look into their life, they look into their history, they question Edith, and there is absolutely no indication that she would do this to her husband. And they were able to rule her out. This is when police learn something kind of strange. Uh, so at Rudy's property, one day the pool seems to be filled with motor oil. Someone had deliberately done this. Rudy suspected it was done by an individual who owned this property, the Edgemar Condominiums, which was right across the way from Rudy's property. That particular man was Walter Dendy, the droopiest man I've ever seen. Police learned that there was a little bit of a feud going on between Walter and Rudy. You see, on the walkway, kind of in between their properties, uh, Rudy began to uh, build a little fence, and then he started to grow hedges. The hedges were blocking views from Walter's property, views that people would see the ocean, and this really pissed off Walter. Walter repeatedly asked Rudy to cut down the, the bushes, but he said no, because he can do what he wants on his property, and that's the truth. Then one day, Rudy came out to see that someone had basically killed all of the bushes. He probably used some kind of chemical to do it. However, Walter had no criminal history, and by everyone's account, he seemed to be a really good guy, an upstanding citizen. So police started to look elsewhere for now. So through a series of tips, police would find the white pickup truck that was seen fleeing from the supermarket parking lot the day Rudy was doused in acid. Witnesses recall seeing at least two men in this truck. The truck was owned by a man named John Coburn Alexander. When police talked to him, he said he had lent his truck to his friends. One of those friends was Emilio Sharifardin. He did have a criminal history. Police has since learned that Emilio had left Florida and gone all the way to the Palm Springs, California area. So they had to track him all the way down over there. And when police apprehended him, he just confessed. He did maintenance for Walter at Walter's condominiums. Walter had approached Emilio and said, hey, I need you to take care of a problem. So at first he had him dump motor oil in the swimming pool on Rudy's property in order to basically get Rudy fired from his property. And then he also hired them to destroy the bushes. But nothing, that wasn't working. The plan wasn't working. And then Walter said to Emilio, I need you to blind Rudy. And so police tracked down receipts that show that Walter had purchased 19 gallons of sulfuric acid. And then Emilio would get the truck from his friend. Emilio then picked up the human version of Beaker, also known as Neil Bross. And then Emilio gave him the responsibility to take a bucket of sulfuric acid and throw it into the face of Rudy. They followed him to the supermarket parking lot. Emilio was the getaway driver. And it's exactly what they did. In the truck, they found clothing that had acid burns on them. So just to kind of corroborate the story, they were told that there was an igloo cooler in the back of the pickup truck that appeared to have some kind of acid damage to it. 
but the owner of the truck had thrown away that cooler, not realizing what had transpired. So Walter Dendy was arrested and charged for the conspiracy to murder Rudy Huda. The 67-year-old man was convicted of second-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Emilio Sharifardin, who was the getaway driver, he was convicted of second-degree murder and he was sentenced to 25 years. Unbelievably, the guy who actually did the murder himself, meep, 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 Neil Brass, he only got 15 years. Apparently, he wasn't aware that the acid was strong enough to kill someone. He was only hired to blind the man. At one point, his conviction and Walter's conviction were overturned very briefly for a legal reason, but then they were retried in 2005 and then resentenced to the same thing. Emilio passed away in prison in 2020. Neil was released on parole in 2013, all because of a property dispute. So stupid. Car found abandoned on the side of the road, and to this day, it is still an unsolved mystery. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Don Kemp. Viewer discretion is advised. Paul Donald Kemp Jr., who would go by Don, he was born on April 21st, 1947, in Baltimore, Maryland. By the time he was 35 years old, he was an advertising executive in New York, and he was quite successful. But then, unfortunately, he got into a really debilitating uh, car accident. And from there, he decided not to go back to his job in New York. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a book about Abraham Lincoln, something he was passionate about, history. In September of 1982, he made the decision to move to Wyoming. November 15, 1982, he showed up at the Old West Museum in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Allegedly, he walked around there for a few hours, but didn't speak to anyone. He was very silent. When he left, he dropped a little bag that had several belongings in it. A couple hours after he left, he called the museum to say, hey, did I leave some belongings there? They said yes. He said, okay, I'm on my way back to go get them. But he never showed up. Don was never seen from again. The very next morning on November 16th, 1982, his Chevy Blazer was found abandoned. It was on Interstate 80. Next to the vehicle was a whole bunch of clothes just thrown everywhere. The driver's side door was open, but no signs of anyone. The car would later be identified as belonging to Don Kemp. They found a single set of footprints in the snow, uh, kind of leading into a prairie. When Don's mom heard about this, she was convinced that he had been abducted or kidnapped and then something harmful was done to him. Police searched this area, which was in the Carbon County, Wyoming area, and they searched it for about three days before a blizzard hit. The blizzard was really bad, and so they, it was impossible to continue searching. However, before that three days was up, they did find some things. They found a white duffel bag that had a bunch of clothing and belongings in it that would later be identified as belonging to Don. This was found just a mile away from where his car was found. Don's mother believes they were planted there. Then, six miles from where the car was found, uh, they would find this abandoned barn. Inside the barn, they found a fresh pile of wood sticks that they believe someone was attempting to start a fire with. Next to those sticks, they found three white socks, which would later be identified as belonging to Don Kemp. Again, his mother believes they were planted. In the snow, they only found one set of tracks that were leading to the barn, but never any prints leading away. Police say that if these were Don's tracks, he probably just walked over his previous tracks to disguise it. But then the blizzard hit, and then the search went cold. Until three years later. Skeletal remains were found about two miles away from where the car had been left. They were confirmed to be that of Don Kemp. Unfortunately, due to the state of the remains, the actual cause of death was never able to be determined, but police believe that he died in the blizzard. Their theory is that Don was having some mental health issues and he had just got out of his car where it was found and he wandered off into the snowy openness. Then he, they believe that he noticed that police were then out there looking for him and he got nervous, so he tried to hide. And then he kind of got stuck in that, you know, massive blizzard. And there is where he just froze to death and died. But they can't confirm that with his remains. His mother believes, of course, that that's not possible, that he was kidnapped and murdered. She believes this for two reasons. After Don was reported officially missing, there were two sightings of him. One was at a museum about Abraham Lincoln. 
which would fit, you know, the bill. The other sighting was from a uh, tavern waitress, and she was positive that she spoke to Don Kemp. The other clue is a little more kind of haunting. One of Don's friends received a few phone calls roughly five months after Don had disappeared. And keep in mind, at this point, police think he had already been dead. This friend had voicemails on their answering machine. She said it was Don's voice. He gave the phone number, and she called that phone number. There would be a series of phone calls made between the friend and this individual. She called saying, hey, can I talk to Don? And he's like, Don isn't here. And then she never got anything more out of it. Police confirmed there was, in fact, an answering machine recording. They heard it. They confirmed these phone calls actually happened. They traced the phone call to Casper, Wyoming, about 180 miles away from where Don had disappeared. They came from a man who lived in this white trailer. When police talked to him, he said, I didn't make those phone calls. He said he knew nothing about it. He knew nothing about Don Kemp. But police can confirm the calls came from this place. They were real phone calls. He was brought in for questioning, interrogated, and they let him go. Three weeks after that, the man moved out of that trailer and moved out of state. They did, however, say he was always very cooperative. And police are back to still thinking that Don Kemp died in the blizzard just three days after he disappeared. They do not suspect any foul play. His mother believes that the man in that white trailer is responsible for his death. And she believes that her son was murdered. And because there's no way of determining exactly how he died, and unless someone comes forward with any new information, this case will remain an unsolved mystery. She just dropped her debit card, and unfortunately that would lead to one of the worst freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was 23-year-old Victoria Strauss. She lived in the Columbus, Ohio area. She was a beloved daughter, a beloved sister. She was described as vibrant, energetic. She was funny, she was caring, and she was someone who loved to express herself through dance. She was a fantastic dancer. She participated in dance competitions all over the country. She's won several awards. They said that she was truly herself when she was out there dancing or cheering. She was also a graduate of the Florida Atlantic University where she got her bachelor's degree in psychology. On the evening of January 18th, 2021, Victoria was leaving this building and it was a parking garage. At 11.37 p.m., CCTV camera would pick up Victoria trying to exit the parking garage. And as you're leaving, you have to pay the machine, you know, for the parking. So as Victoria is going to put the card in the machine, she accidentally did something we've all done before at drive throughs or ATMs. She dropped the card. So she opens the door and she leans over to pick the card up. And, you know, her head and like her upper torso are out of the car. The camera at that point picks her car up moving, so she accidentally hits the acceleration and drove the car forward. The car collided into the payment kiosk, and this actually caused the door to slam basically on her head, and it pinned her into the door. And at that point, she was unable to, to do anything to like back the car up because she couldn't reach the thing to reverse the car or anything. She wasn't discovered until approximately 5.30 the following morning. And when police arrived with ambulance, she was pronounced dead at the scene. And that's when they were able to pull up footage and see exactly what happened. About two months after she passed, the coroner report would come out that said that she suffered from mechanical asphyxia, which is basically when something causes you to stop breathing. But her actual cause of death was blunt force trauma to her head. I don't know if this was like an immediate type death or if it took a certain amount of time. I'm not sure. But it's just a situation where you're like, you don't think this could ever happen. We've all dropped our cards at machines and drive throughs like I said. And most often than not, we're not aware that our foot is still on the pedal, right? Or near it. I never really knew that this is something that could happen until now. So now I can say that because of this story, now we can make sure we know to, you know, take our foot away. It's very tragic. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lori Lynn Rothrock. Viewer discretion is advised.
Unfortunately, I really can't find any background information on Lori, and the case itself has very little information. I do know that Lori was born on March 5th, 1976, and she lived in Oregon, specifically in the Douglas County area. Lori worked at a fast stop market and convenience store. She was working there on September 16th, 2014. She was working a late night shift there. At approximately 3 o'clock in the morning, a customer would walk into the store and at first didn't see anyone there. But when they looked around the counter, they found a very horrific scene. There was a woman on the ground just lying in a massive pool of blood. That woman was 38-year-old Lori Lynn Rothrock. Lori had unfortunately been stabbed numerous times, and she had a significant amount of blunt force trauma to her head. There were no witnesses to the attack. However, there was a camera in the store focused directly on the front counter, and when they played the tape, they caught the entire incident. After reviewing the footage, they got a very clear look at the individual who did this. It was 27-year-old John Joseph Flanagan. I guess he was known to police. So they got a warrant for his arrest. They go to his house, and this is now a couple of days after the murder took place. And when they get there, basically they arrest him without incident. He is still wearing the exact same bloody clothing he was wearing during the attack. The footage showed him stabbing Lori and also hitting her over the head with a mallet. And in his house, they find the knife and they find the mallet, both covered in blood and it was confirmed to be Lori's blood. When they bring him in for questioning, they ask him what happened. He said he did not know Lori at all, never met her before, but he hated her. For what reason, I'm not sure. Now, John Joseph Flanagan was scheduled for trial in January of 2016, but unfortunately, this is where the story ends, because I cannot find any updates. I have been searching for the past hour and a half or so, and I cannot find any records of the trial, any news articles about it, no news clips about it. I have been searching the Oregon inmate records, and I cannot find him anywhere. So, unfortunately, I don't know if Lori got the justice she so rightfully deserved. I'm assuming she did. I'm hoping she did. But if anyone in the area sees this and knows, I would love to know if she got her justice. But I've been having a hell of a time trying to find that information. Hello, true crimeers. I have an update to a case I posted just yesterday, the case of Lori Lynn Rothrock. But first, I want to say TikTok, this app is so broken right now. Not only are people still having issues with everything buffering when they're trying to watch a video, I have now recorded a few videos where I've had to re-record them because the audio didn't catch on any of it. So frustrating. At any rate, I, in my video, if you click the comment, it goes back to that video. I was having a hell of a time trying to figure out what happened to Lori Lynn Rothrock's killer, John Flanagan. I had searched the Oregon uh, inmate records, could not find him anywhere. I had searched, and I'll show you, so I had searched the uh, Oregon court records for John Flanagan, and on my computer I was met with uh, access denied, but here on my phone I was met with no cast cases match your search. And so I was looking forever to find what happened to this dude. And then this lovely individual here, uh, Goddess, uh, they found the information on this, on this place, which I'm now convinced you used magic. I don't know why I couldn't find this. I hate myself for not being able to find this. But anyway, uh, you can see that his case number is there. He was charged with murder and he pled not guilty. So his initial trial was scheduled for January of 2016, but in February 2016, he was sent in for a psychological evaluation because the man basically just walked into a convenience store. He claims he did not know Lori, but he said he just hated her. And so he stabbed her multiple times and then hit her over the head with um, a hammer or a mallet. And then uh, the, the, the update after that was he was basically ordered to transport into the custody of the Oregon State Hospital for treatment in September of 2016. So, 
as of right now in 2023, as far as we can see, uh, John Flanagan is being held in the Oregon State Hospital um, due to being, basically he was unfit to stand trial. So I guess Lori kind of got justice, but really also not really because he wasn't found guilty and given a jail sentence, um, but he is off the streets. So that's a plus, I guess. But thank you very much for this information. He would write in a journal, I fully intend to expedite a number of souls to the gates of heaven or to the dungeons of hell. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Loring Park murders. Viewer discretion is advised. As a matter of fact, I covered a case just yesterday about a gay man who was killed in the same exact park, which apparently is a pattern. Joel Larson was born on September 15, 1969 in Iowa. Later on in life, he would move to Minneapolis, Minnesota. Joel was a gay man, and he felt that moving from Iowa to a bigger city, he would be more accepted and safer. He made that move in the 80s. On July 31st, 1991, Joel, who was actually legally blind, was walking through Loring Park in Minneapolis, and it was shortly before midnight when all of a sudden he was accosted. In an apparent robbery attempt, he had been shot in the chest. The assailant would flee. Joel managed to stand up and stagger towards the street where he collapsed, and sadly, he died. Police were able to collect some bullet fragments, but there really wasn't many other pieces of evidence. Just a couple weeks later, on August 10th, 1991, 19-year-old Cord Drast was found lying face down in the same park with blood around him. When police arrived, they discovered he had two bullet wounds to his back, but he survived. Cord, by the way, was also a gay man. Loring Park at the time was a popular area, especially late at night for the uh, gay scene. But after arriving at the hospital after surgery, he was able to give a description to police of who shot him. He described the assailant as a man who was about five foot nine. He had long hair and he wore a baseball hat. The exact same night that he was shot, as police were searching the park, they found another victim. 48-year-old John Chenoweth. They discovered him with two bullet wounds to his chest and he was deceased. John was actually a former state senator there in Minnesota who apparently was also gay, but was very like down low about it. They would recover bullets from his body and they compared those bullets to the first murder that occurred, Joel Larson, and they confirmed that those bullets were a match. So whoever shot and killed Mr. Chenoweth was the same person who also killed Mr. Larson. And this was from a 38 caliber gun. Unfortunately though, the case pretty much went cold because there was no like actual witnesses to any of these murders. The gay community was on edge because, you know, now there's three of them in that community who have been shot and two of them died. In February of 1992, they got kind of a break. News organizations received a six-page letter claiming to be someone from a group called the AIDS Commission. The letters appear to be coming from the actual killer. The letter stated that the murders are now slowing the spread of AIDS. And then a short time after those letters were sent, the Gay Lesbian Community Action Council, or the GLCAC, they received a phone call from a person claiming to be the murderer and said, more are coming. And again, they said they were from the AIDS Commission, a group that does not actually exist. So police would tap the phone lines and then they were able to pull off a trace when the guy called back again. The calls came from a man named J. Thomas Johnson. He was 24 years old and he worked at a local Denny's. Cord Drast, who was the second shooting victim that survived, basically said, yep, that's the guy. In his home, he had newspaper clippings on his walls, like a movie serial killer would have. They also found the same exact baseball hat that Cord described. They found a long wig that looked like the hair Cord described. They found also a 38 caliber weapon, which they tested and confirmed that that was the murder weapon. They found a journal in his belongings that basically said he aspired to become a serial killer and he really wanted to be notorious. Allegedly, he was also a gay man who also apparently had AIDS. So his journal said that now there was a new sense of urgency. I fully intend to expedite a large number of souls to the gates of heaven or to the uh, dungeons of hell. 
Police discovered that Johnson grew up in a very troubled home. He was taught and raised to literally hate gay people. So he always hid that aspect of himself because, well, he was basically taught to hate himself. He never found acceptance in his life, from his friends, from his family. He was taught that his life was basically evil and wrong. Once he contracted the AIDS virus, well, he apparently decided to take action and some sort of weird revenge. Apparently, uh, the virus in him essentially never really took over because he's actually still alive today. Jay Johnson was charged with two counts of first degree murder and one count of attempted murder. He would not go to trial. Instead, he would plead guilty to all charges and he got two concurrent life sentences plus an additional 15 years on top of that for the attempted murder. And he is still rotting in his prison cell to this very day. A New Hampshire man calls 911 and says he just committed two necessary killings. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Donald and Pamela Lefebvre. Viewer discretion is advised. 63-year-old Donald Lefebvre and his 54-year-old wife, Pamela, they lived in the Goffstown area uh, in New Hampshire. Unfortunately, I cannot find any photos of Donald or Pamela, and I cannot find a photo of their eventual killer. So we're going super generic here. This is Goffstown. On June 3rd, 2000, 911 there in Goffstown received a 911 call that was honestly kind of calm. It was from a man named Brian Patton. He said he just committed two necessary killings. He said he felt so bad for doing it, but he could not bear what his two victims were doing to him. He told the operator, I took a lot of medication and I just had to do it. When police arrived, they asked the man to come out. He said no. So they go inside cautiously and it takes them some time to actually subdue this man and get him in cuffs. As they search the home, they do in fact find two very bloody bodies. Pamela Lefebvre had experienced multiple skull fractures caused by a mallet. No, not this one. Donald Lefebvre also has skull fractures and severe brain damage. Donald had eight blows to his head, three blows to his back, and three to his hands. Pamela had six total blows to her head. Later, when they tested blood on the mallet, it was confirmed to belong to both victims. And then while searching the house, they found a handwritten letter, apparently written by Brian. The letter said, I, Brian Keith Patton, died so that my daughters and son would live better, to save them all, and I'm truly sorry. Love, Brian. And then there was a PS that said, I have had thoughts of serial killings. So I thought before I did it, I should probably end myself. Now, Pamela was his mother. Donald was his stepfather. And apparently he decided to make them victims instead of ending his own life. Why did he do it? Because his mother and stepfather told him, we're gonna need you to contribute money to the house. And they asked for about a third of his paycheck. So for him, that was motive enough to kill them. Instead of going through with his plans, supposed plans, to end his own life only. Brian would go on trial. His defense tried to argue that we know he did it, but this isn't premeditated murder. The prosecution, however, said no, he definitely thought about this and then did it. And so the jury convicted him of first degree murder, premeditated murder. So Brian Patton was sentenced to life in prison without parole all because he had to pay rent. A body of a young boy was found inside of a trunk in which nobody knew was missing. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Quincy Davis. Viewer discretion is advised. Quincy Jamar Davis was born on June 23rd, 1990, and he was born in North Carolina, but at some points they moved to Virginia. Quincy was described as a big-hearted prankster, a flirt, a goofball, and just a really good friend. And he also loved running track. Now, Quincy was attending Virginia Beach Middle School in Virginia, and then just sort of one day, he just stopped showing up. And this adds a layer of tragedy that just makes this so much worse because nobody knew it. Nobody knew or realized that Quincy was just suddenly gone. No one looked for him. Uh, family, friends, 
I think a lot of people at school just assumed that maybe he and his mom and his brother had just sort of moved away and didn't say anything. But nobody, nobody knew that he went missing. The mother never reported him missing. But it's just staggering to me that not one person thought to themselves, oh my God, I haven't seen Quincy in so long. Where is he? That is until June of 2015, when Tanya Slayton, who was Quincy's mother, was pulled over on the I-64 near Virginia. During what they called a routine traffic stop, I guess something led to them wanting to open the trunk. I believe it was like a really strong odor. So when the police officer opened the trunk, there was a bunch of clothing on top of a black trash bag that had been tied up. When they ripped open the trash bag, they found a decomposed human body of what they could determine was probably a young person. And it would later turn out to be the body of Quincy Davis. The coroner would determine that he died sometime around 2004, maybe 2005. And his mother, Tanya, had him in her trunk for up to 11 years. A decomposing body in her trunk for over a decade and nobody noticed. And then in 2007, she drove up to an ex-boyfriend's house and shot four rounds into his home. She was arrested, charged, and convicted for that crime. She served four years in prison while her son's body is still in the trunk of her car that still nobody noticed. It's unbelievable to me. In 2018, she would finally plead guilty to murdering her son. She didn't say how, and the coroner couldn't determine how. She was only given a 10-year sentence for that. Being skinned alive while being attacked by a bear would easily be one of the worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. This was 36-year-old Alexei Ivanovsky, and he lived in Russia. In October of 2019, he and some friends would go do some crab hunting. They went to the Kuril Islands, which is in East Russia. And as far as they knew, they were kind of away from most of the wildlife. But out of nowhere, and this is an actual photo of the bear from that day, a mama bear and her two cubs surrounded Alexei and attacked him. The mama bear grabbed him by the leg and began to pull him away from the site. This is the site where he was dragged. This is his actual buckets that he dropped during the attack. The friends are trying to throw rocks at the bear, trying to like get the bear to leave him alone, but the bear begins to take its claws and it starts to scratch and claw at Alexei's head. And eventually he rips the skin off of his scalp. Then she slashes her claws down his back where later it would be revealed that the skin on his back was peeled off from this, as well as from his rear end, like completely peeled off. She was also biting down very forcefully, uh, created some severe damage to one of his legs, and also it tore one of Alexei's ears off. This entire time, Alexei is screaming for his life, but there is nothing he can do, and his friends are doing everything they can think of to try to get this to stop. The bear continued to pummel him with her claws and continue to just bite and bite at him. Eventually, one of the friends gets in the car and begins to drive towards the bears and flashing the headlights at them. And finally, the bears flee. So rescue arrives sometime after this. And when they get there, they actually say that Alexei is technically dead there, but they rush him to the nearest hospital where they're able to revive him. For the next week or so, he is basically in a coma. They're able to reattach his ear. However, they did have to amputate his leg. Several locals would donate blood in any kind of effort to try to save his life. But ultimately, a week or so after the attack, the trauma from all of it, it caused his heart to just fail. He had a heart attack and he passed away. He went through several minutes of absolute hell. And as far as anyone knows, the bears were unprovoked. Um, they didn't even see them. And as far as I can tell, the bears weren't like later hunted down and killed or anything, which sometimes happens in this situation. But Jesus, that is, that is a hell of a way to go. He would just go out for a jog. And to this very day, she has never been brought home. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Tiffany Sessions. Viewer discretion is advised.
Tiffany was a 20-year-old student at the University of Florida, and she lived in an apartment with a roommate there in Tampa. It was February 9th, 1989. Sometime between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. that day, Tiffany told her roommate that she was going to go out for a jog and that she would be home pretty soon. So she left the apartment, decked out in her running gear, but then she never got back to the apartment. Three to four hours would pass and her roommate realized that something was wrong. So she contacted Tiffany's mom to let her know what was going on. Tiffany had left everything behind, all of her belongings, even her ID and her wallet. Her car was still parked just outside the apartment. She had given absolutely no indication that she was planning to just suddenly leave. And it was very much unlike her to even do that. So police were contacted very quickly. And the search for Tiffany, pictured here with her half-brother, it began. People came out in droves to help search for her. The police, along with family, friends, volunteers, came in by the busload to help look for her. They had this massive grid search that they were meticulous to search, but they never found anything. Not her body, not any clothing items, nothing. One witness says they think they saw Tiffany just after she left her apartment to go jogging, talking to two individuals sitting in a car. The witness, though, doesn't know if Tiffany got in the car, and she can't even say for sure if it's her. Over the years, as the bodies of, like, Jane and John Doe's came in, all of them would be tested to see if they belonged to her, but they never have. They interviewed everyone in her life, people at school, her family, her friends, people she dated, and they've been able to rule all of them out. It is believed that Tiffany is deceased and that she was likely taken and murdered that day. One suspect they had was a man named Michael Knickerbocker, who apparently confessed to killing her and hiding her body. However, the police never found the remains where he said she was. He also said he buried one of her clothing items, and when police went to go dig that item up, they found something with blood on it, but it didn't belong to Tiffany at all. It wasn't her blood. Then they figured out that he didn't even live remotely close to where she was. He was lying. He would later go on to be convicted of several sexual assaults and also a murder. In 2014, they uncovered some information that suggests a man named Paul Rolls may have been her kidnapper and murderer. In 1994, he was convicted of 19 counts of sexual battery and assault, and he died in prison in 2013. The year after he died, DNA linked him to a murder. Police believe that that murder was likely his first murder of possibly a few. So they searched the area where they found the body of his first victim, and they excavated the entire area. I mean, they searched a bunch of land, and they did not come across any other human remains. He also lived pretty close to where Tiffany lived. As a matter of fact, the first victim's body was found only a mile away from where Tiffany was last seen alive. He also, at that time that she went missing, I guess he delivered construction materials, and he had a construction site to deliver materials to that was literally on the same exact path that Tiffany would have jogged on. Police also uncovered this day planner that Paul had in his prison cell. They found something very interesting. On one of the pieces of paper, he wrote the number 2 followed by 2989. That is the day that Tiffany disappeared. He had never been talked to about her disappearance or anything. So, this is either a crazy coincidence, or she may have been one of his victims. But, like I said, he died in prison in 2013, so they'll never be able to question him. And to this day, Tiffany Sessions has never been recovered. She had never been spotted after that day. They do know that she was wearing a Rolex watch that day, and it was also, you know, never recovered. So they had the serial number, I guess, for that particular watch. And so the Rolex company has now flagged it so that if anyone tries to sell it, they'll know who sold it. But that may be a long shot. If you have any information about the disappearance of Tiffany Sessions, you can contact the local sheriff's office at 352-384-3323. And perhaps you can help give her family the closure they deserve. A seven-year-old girl was lured into a public restroom, and what followed was unimaginable horror. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Sharice Iverson. Viewer discretion 
is advised. Charisse was born on October 20th, 1989 in Los Angeles, California. Unfortunately, she only got to live for seven years, so there is not much of a backstory on her. It was Memorial Day weekend, May 25th, 1997, in Prim, Nevada. Charisse and her family were there on vacation. At approximately 3.30 a.m. at the Prima Donna Resort, Charisse was basically left on her own while her father was upstairs gambling. Charisse would be caught on CCTV as she was kind of roaming around the arcade, and there were several other people there as well. Sometime shortly after 4 a.m., Charisse's body was discovered in the women's restroom. Someone had tried to shove her in the toilet, and it appeared that someone had also sexually assaulted her. Once police had the CCTV footage, they found something kind of disturbing. A younger white male was walking around the arcade at one point with a friend. But then this footage picks him up playing with what appears to be the seven-year-old girl, Charisse Iverson. He's kind of following her around at different arcade machines, and then at one point they're playing hide-and-go-seek. Police would later find more footage of this man outside the hotel, and a few days later they were able to discover who it was. It was an 18-year-old man named Jeremy Strohmeyer. He had been in Prim, Nevada with a friend and his family. They were visiting from Long Beach, California. He was actually arrested in Long Beach, and this was because police had been sharing images of this man at the casino who was just wanted for questioning, and his own friends and family recognized him, so they turned him in. So he was extradited back to Las Vegas. Jeremy was adopted by a very wealthy family um, when he was really, really young. And from there, he led a very, very privileged life. He basically got anything he wanted. He even had his own private jet. When he was shown the CCTV footage and presented with, you know, evidence, he just basically confessed. And I do want to give you a bit of a trigger warning because what I'm about to tell you is extremely disturbing. Jeremy and his 17-year-old friend David Cash were roaming the arcade. Charisse had this like wadded up paper towel that she was like throwing and it accidentally hit uh, Jeremy. Jeremy decided to take this opportunity to play with her and play hide and go seek around the arcade. He tells police that at that point he said the safest and best place for you to hide Charisse would be in the women's restroom. And she took his advice and she went into the women's restroom. Jeremy and his friend David then proceeded to go into the women's restroom shortly after her. All of that of them all walking into the restroom was caught on camera. He says they played for a few minutes and then he suddenly put his hand around her mouth and dragged her into the handicap stall. David Cash went into the stall opposite and was kind of looking over. He said at that point she was struggling, trying to scream, and she was flailing about when two women came into the restroom and he made sure that she was quiet. And both men kind of hid. After the women left the restroom, uh, Jeremy, he began to, he said, fondle the little girl because he was attracted to her. Uh, and then he sexually assaulted her. And then at one point his friend just leaves the restroom. But then Jeremy decides, well, this little girl knows what I look like and what I just did to her, so now she needs to be silent. He says he strangled her for a few minutes, but she kind of slipped in and out of consciousness but didn't die. He then says he took his hand underneath her chin and another hand behind her head and snapped her neck, he said, like he had seen in the movies. It still didn't work. She was still alive and still flailing. So then he grabbed her again in the same way and he snapped her neck a second time. Then he says he realized she was dead. He folded her body in half and tried to shove her in the toilet. And then he just calmly walked out 20 minutes later and went about his business. And the camera picks him up acting completely normal like nothing happened. During Jeremy's confession, the detective said he was just totally calm, cool, and collected like it was nothing. They asked him, did you at any point try to give her CPR to maybe, you know, reverse what you did after he strangled her? He said, no, I just knew I had to kill her, so I killed her. During their investigation, they found out that all of the girlfriends he had in the past, he tried to make them dress up like little girls. When all of this came about, his adopted parents found out that his birth parents both struggled with severe mental health issues, but the adoption agency never foreclosed that information. So his adopted parents would later sue the system. And this whole thing actually ended up changing adoption laws, at least in California, where now all of that information about the parents has to be disclosed. 
Prosecutors would seek the death penalty for Jeremy, but he would eventually just plead guilty so that he didn't get the death penalty, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. His friend David Cash was never prosecuted. David Cash even told a newspaper that he didn't dwell on the murder. He said, quote, I'm not going to get upset over somebody else's life. I just worry about myself first. I'm not going to lose sleep over somebody else's problems, end quote. He later said, I don't feel remorse because I didn't know her. He would only be labeled as the bad Samaritan, but he got off scot-free. That later led to bills in Nevada that required people to report crimes. Her father also wasn't punished, even though he was told not to leave her alone. It took only six seconds for a man to die in one of the worst freak accidents. Fewer discretion is advised. This story takes place in January of 2004 at Briggs Metal, which is located in Newark in Nottinghamshire, which is in England. I'm sure people will correct my pronunciation below. This is the only photo I could find from this particular story, and I, I'm assuming that this is the machine that this happened in. But a 45-year-old worker was doing maintenance work on a metal shearing machine, a scrap metal machine that they said was strong enough and large enough to, I guess, scrap and crush cars. Apparently, he was in there trying to replace some of the blades. There, I guess, is a remote control in there that's supposed to help them release the blades, but this worker accidentally pressed the wrong button. And then what happened, in a matter of six seconds, they described it as the wings of the crusher box basically closed in on him, and it sliced him directly in half at the waist. His body was completely separated into two parts. In that six seconds, it took to close. I don't know how long it took from when it made contact with him to actually cut him in half. I assume, though, it happened fairly quickly. You may be wondering why he didn't try to stop the machine. Well, he tried. There was an emergency stop button on that same remote. They believe he was trying to press it, but it would not have mattered. Because that button was broken. As a matter of fact, the owners of this place knew that that button was broken days and days in advance. When investigating, they found out that in that time frame, after knowing the button was broken, workers would still go into this machine. The owners of the scrapyard knew this and did not reprimand any of them, nor did the owners fix the button. I'm not sure if the individual who died in this was aware of the emergency stop button was broken because it doesn't sound like they all knew, but it also goes to show they weren't telling everyone. The owner of the scrapyard was prosecuted not to serve any jail time, but to basically end up paying a lot of money. In total, he was ordered to pay 57,000 pounds, roughly $72,000 in the United States. This entire thing could have been prevented and a man could still be alive had they just fixed a simple goddamn button. Hello, true crimeers. So there is some updated uh, information on the Delphi murder case or some people refer to it as the down the hill killer case. The case of Abby Williams and Libby German, who were both murdered in Delphi, Indiana. I'm sure most of you know that uh, Richard Allen was arrested and charged with their murders. Finally, after about five years of not knowing who this guy was and who their killer was. Well, the first bit of information came a couple of weeks ago that I hadn't noticed, but I guess Richard Allen has filed a motion to eliminate ballistic evidence from the trial. That they haven't talked a whole lot about what evidence they have um, because they need to keep most of it, you know, as close to chest as possible for his trial. But near the bodies, when they found them, and this wasn't revealed from the time they were found, but it was revealed many, many years later, that there was an unspent bullet uh, found near their bodies. So apparently, Richard Allen and his defense are trying to have some of that evidence, I guess, taken out. But most of that information is redacted, so exactly what they're going for isn't 100% known. But here's the bigger piece of news that just came out today. The Delphi murder suspect allegedly confessed several times in a jail call with his wife. 
This was back in April uh, where Richard Allen was having recorded phone conversations with his wife with regards to this case. How these prisoners still don't understand that their calls are literally always recorded, I, I'll, never, I'll never get. But apparently multiple times he referred directly to being responsible for killing Abby and Libby. I don't think they've released the transcripts of this call, but they said it was pretty clear that he just flat out confessed to killing both of them. And then his wife just abruptly ended the call. I think there are some people out there who have doubts that he is the Delphi killer, but, but him confessing on the phone to his own wife in a recorded call, uh, that's you know pretty much the evidence you need there. However, he must still be found guilty in a court of law because that's how it works. And from what I understand, his trial is tentatively set for January of 2024. So I'm sure around that time we will have a lot more information about everything. But hopefully Abby and Libby and their families get the justice they so desperately deserve. A 31-year-old mother of two would enter this women's restroom at a rest stop alive. She would come out in a body bag. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jane Snow. Viewer discretion is advised. Jane Barabo Snow was born on April 11th, 1948. She was born in Ostego County in Michigan. Her and her husband had two children, two boys. On the evening of Tuesday, May 15th, 1979, Jane and her two sons were traveling. They were actually going to Escanaba in Michigan, and that's where Jane's parents lived, and she was just going to go visit them. The drive was supposed to take a few hours. At approximately 7.30 p.m., she pulled off into a rest stop because her and the boys needed to use the restroom. The rest stop was just outside of Gaylord, Michigan. The two boys went into the men's room, and then Jane went into the women's restroom. The two boys came out and sat outside the restroom waiting for their mother. And they kept waiting and kept waiting. But Jane never came out. So the two boys concerned entered the women's restroom and they saw something that no child should ever have to see. Their 31-year-old mother was lying on the ground of the restroom covered in blood. And there was blood all over the restroom. They managed to get police to come and they determined that Jane had been stabbed 22 times. Her clothes were on and there was no sign of a sexual assault. When police questioned the boys, they said that when they got to the rest area, it was only their car there. No one else was there. And they never saw anyone leave the women's restroom. They also never really heard any screams. The knife was not there and it's never been found. Now, I only have this photo of him, but he was obviously much, much younger back then. But a 20-something-year-old hitchhiker named John Magali, coincidentally, he had been picked up by a state trooper. He was hitchhiking. He was picked up about 10, 15 minutes after Jane was found. The state trooper dropped him off at another exit and went about his business. Then the state trooper found out about the murder and realized I picked up a hitchhiker from kind of in that area. Three days later, John Magali was picked up by police and extradited back to Rhode Island for unrelated charges. He had blood on his clothing then. The state trooper did not notice if he had blood on his clothing when he picked him up. He never got out of the car, so he never really got a good look at him, other than, like, his face. But they never had anything to actually pin the murder of Jane on him. He was temporarily arrested, but then he was let go because they had no evidence. I mean, they had absolutely nothing. Decades later, they would test the blood on his shirt. It was not Jane's. Whose it was? No idea. And that was the only evidence they could have possibly had to link him to it. Unfortunately, Jane Snow's case has gone unsolved ever since. If you have information, contact the Ostego County Sheriff's Department. Oh no, it's too far down. No, no. Okay. Hang on to your butts. No, thank you. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. Touch me with this. No. Oh, we do loops. We do loops. No, we don't do loops. We don't, we don't do loops. Can you slow your road, please? Oh, God. No. Ugh. <sighs> 
No. Hello, true crimers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. This insanity was the La Quimera, and it was located at a theme park in Mexico called La Fiera Chapultepec. It opened in 1964, and it's located, or was located, in Mexico City. Not a super large place, but the La Quimera ride was by far its most popular. It had three distinctive loops, reached top speeds of 53 miles per hour, or 85 kilometers an hour, had a g-force of 4.7, and its highest point was 111 feet. It basically consisted of a, a train. Each train held about 20 people. It was September 28th, 2019. Towards the end of the ride, the last car, and this was caught on video, it's a bad photo of it, but the last car derailed completely and then flipped kind of almost upside down. This happened at approximately 33 feet up, or 10 meters. Sadly, two individuals who were in that last car, when it flipped, uh, even with the restraints, they fell from the car and they landed um, on the railings and then on the ground below. Those two individuals would be pronounced dead at the scene. Five other people who had broken free from the ride also were severely injured, but they did survive. This incident caused there to be a major investigation done at this theme park. What they discovered was something pretty awful. There was almost no maintenance done on any of their coasters, ever. There were design flaws that were never fixed. They ran the coaster at higher speeds than it was supposed to run. Just a few weeks after the incident took place, the Mexican authorities closed the park permanently, and their operational licenses were all revoked. By 2022, the park has been dismantled and demolished. I can only assume they were sued for the deaths and injuries, but I don't know for sure. Usually these things are kept private. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Sandra Marie Martin. Viewer discretion is advised. Sandra Martin was a 24-year-old bartender here at the Shenanigans Lounge, which was located in German Township in Pennsylvania. I was able to find one obscure old news clip um, about this case, but it did not show Sandra's image. And this is like the only image of the bar that they showed. I have searched obituaries, I have searched find a grave, and I cannot find a photo of Sandra, unfortunately. But on the evening of March 23rd, 1987, the 24 year old was working at the bar and she was due to close the bar that night. At approximately 11 o'clock the following morning, the bar's owner would go to the front door and notice that the door was unlocked and open. He noticed that Sandra's car was still in the parking lot. Inside, he noticed that the till was emptied, but Sandra's purse was also missing. At the back entrance of the bar, he noticed something very concerning. Trailing away from the door is what appeared to be blood. There were like droplets of blood and then small pools of blood leading away. So he calls Sandra's family. They haven't seen her. And so police are called right away. Sandra at this point is now missing and there's blood outside the bar. So this is something serious. Also in the bar, by the way, they find blood stains on the backs of chairs. They find a broken ashtray with blood and there's some blood spatter on one of the doors. Obviously something horrific happened here. I can only find older photos of the gentleman, but this is Mark Brakeiron. Police would interview several witnesses who were at the bar that night, and every single one of them said that when they were all gone, one patron was left alone with Sandra, and that was Mr. Brakeiron. So police go to question him, and he gives them permission to search his truck. They find blood in his truck. They also find clothing in his possession with blood all over it. When police tested all of the blood, it was the same exact blood type as Sandra. Just a couple of days after she went missing, Sandra's bloodied, deceased body was found. And it was found just outside of where his grandparents lived in like a, a wooded area. On April 3rd, 1987, he was arrested and charged with her murder. It's believed that that night he robbed Sandra and one thing led to another where he had to kill her and then dispose of her body. At his trial in 1988, he tried to say that it was in some kind of self-defense, that she had struck him first after he made a move on her. But the jury didn't buy it. He was found guilty and convicted and sentenced to death. 
Because of some issues with some witnesses, his conviction was overturned and he was retried in 2017. This time he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without parole. He has since tried to appeal, but lost. In the early morning hours of October 17th, 2000, a woman would leave this pub and has never been seen since. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Regina Marie Boz. Viewer discretion is advised. Regina Boz, uh, pictured here in the middle, was born into a large family. She was the third of seven total siblings. She would go by Gina to most people in her life. People described her as someone that would just light up a room the moment she entered. She had a ton of creativity, she loved art, and she loved music. She had also been married twice, and with her first husband, she did have three kids. And both of her divorces ended amicably. Shortly before this case happened in Lincoln, Nebraska, she got herself a job at a FedEx. Her sister said she was really excited for the job. Gina, being a talented musician who loved playing the guitar, she also uh, loved doing open mic nights. And Duggan's Pub there in the Lincoln, Nebraska area hosted these. Gina arrived at the pub sometime around eight or nine and she would do a set. Her ex-husband was also there. He said she was in really good spirits. She was laughing and having a great time. He left the pub around 10 p.m. Other witnesses said that Gina was at the pub until sometime around 1 o'clock in the morning when she left. From there, she was supposed to go to her boyfriend Michael's place. Her and her boyfriend had apparently gotten into some kind of argument a few hours before, like before she went to the pub, but she was still expected at his place after being here. She never got there. Her boyfriend woke up sometime around midnight, realized she wasn't there, and then he just went back to bed. He says around 6.30 the next morning, he called her kids. They said they haven't seen her. He calls again at 6.38 a.m. And again, they haven't heard from her. He then calls the police to report her missing. And then that's when a private investigator gets involved. Now, this isn't her actual vehicle, but this is the same vehicle that she drove. It was found in a parking lot across from Duggan's pub. The trunk, for some reason, was open. Her guitar and musical equipment was in the trunk. Her purse, however, was not in the vehicle, and she was nowhere to be found. Inside the vehicle, no signs of a struggle, no blood, nothing like that. Police believe that she did not leave the vehicle on her own accord. But again, they also had no signs of actual foul play. Gina loved her kids. She was excited for her new job. There's no way she would just pick up and leave. And she brought absolutely nothing with her. Police interviewed her friends, her family, her exes, people at the bar, and they couldn't develop any leads from any of it. Her boyfriend took a lie detector test. He passed with flying colors. They didn't believe he had anything to do with it. Her sister believes that she was met by someone she probably knew and was kidnapped, but she's never been seen since. If you have information, call 402-441-7204. He was just walking home, but he would become the victim of a hate crime. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Terry Knudsen. Viewer discretion is advised. Carol Dale Knudsen, who would go by Terry, he was born on November 28th, 1944. And he lived his entire life in Minnesota, specifically in the Minneapolis area. Unfortunately, this is the only photo of Terry that I can find. And there really isn't a lot of information about this case. I do know that Terry graduated from St. Louis Park Senior High School in 1962. Terry was also gay. And then by 1979, he is apparently working as a Mater D here at the Minneapolis Athletic Club. It was January 6, 1979. Terry had finished his job for the evening here at the Athletic Club, and it's about 2 o'clock in the morning, and he would normally walk home. His walk would take him through Loring Park, which is in Minneapolis. As he was walking through the park, and obviously it's not very populated at that time of the night, Three teenagers, uh, I know for a fact that one of them was 16 years old, and his name was Gregory Allen Smith, they would approach Terry. Gregory Smith had told his two friends, hey, I want to go rob a f and then they used the F slur for gay people. Apparently they knew Terry was gay, they saw him walking through the park, and they grabbed a large metal pipe. The three men then accosted Terry, robbed him, and then they beat him with the pipe. They used that metal pipe to bash his face in. 
He wasn't fighting them. He didn't provoke anything. Gregory Smith just decided this is what he wanted to do to him. After they were done beating him and left him in a bloody mess on the ground, they fled the scene. Terry, this is obviously a younger photo of him, he was 34 years old at the time, was found and rushed to the hospital, and he was in a coma from the get-go. A week later, he passed away from his injuries. I don't know exactly how they found the suspects, but they did. Now, two of the friends of Gregory Allen Smith basically ratted him out. They did so to get lenient sentences, which is what they got. They also interviewed friends of Gregory Allen Smith, who said that Gregory was absolutely bragging and boasting about beating a f slur to death. His two accomplices, like I said, got very lenient sentences. I, I can't find the exact time frames, but they basically got slaps on the wrist. Gregory Allen Smith, he got an intermediate sentence of 1 to 25 years, max. I don't know when he got out, but I do know that he was eventually released. I tried looking up inmate records, but I could not find a photo of him. I hope his life is hell. This is James Bain, a man who was wrongfully convicted of the kidnapping and essay of a nine-year-old boy. A man who spent 35 years in a Florida prison for a crime he never committed. A man that was exonerated and was later awarded $1.75 million from the state of Florida. But sadly, James would have to fight for every penny of that money. All thanks to a Florida law, which was initially designed to help the wrongfully convicted and is now being misused. In March of 1974, a nine-year-old Lake Wales, Florida boy was tragically kidnapped from his bed and drugged to a baseball field where he was S8. During his interrogation, the young boy would describe his attacker as having sideburns and a mustache. A relative of the victim felt that the description matched that of James Bain, and therefore law enforcement included James Bain's photograph in a lineup of five other photos. Tragically, the victim would identify James Bain as his attacker from that lineup. Although law enforcement did think to collect a semen sample from the boy's undergarments, unfortunately, DNA testing was still a full two decades away. Even though James had no criminal record and insisted that at the time of the crime he was home watching TV with his sister, he was still put on trial with a 10th Judicial Circuit Court in Polk County, Florida. It was at that trial that the FBI would testify that the blood collected from those undergarments was type AB and James was type B, which should have excluded him immediately. Tragically, on May 23, 1974, James Bain was found guilty. James would languish in prison for over 25 years until 2001 when he began to request DNA testing from all the evidence of his case. But unfortunately, all of his requests were denied until 2005 when the Innocence Project of Florida accepted his case. In 2009, DNA testing proved that there was no biological match between James Bain and the evidence left at the crime scene, thus proving his innocence. James Bain was exonerated and released on December 17, 2009, after spending more than 35 years of his life in prison for a crime he never committed. More time than any other person exonerated by DNA evidence in the United States. James Bain was 19 years old when he went into prison and 54 years old when he was finally exonerated. When he went into prison, Nixon was president, and when he was finally released, Obama was president. James Bain was awarded over $1.75 million from the state of Florida for his wrongful conviction. But it wasn't until he went on a TV interview to discuss why the Attorney General's office was taking over five months to handle his compensation application that he received any of his money. This is all thanks to Florida's Clean Hands Law, which was designed to give compensation to the wrongfully convicted, but is now being misused to withhold compensation for the wrongfully convicted. Over the next several weeks, I'll be posting a series of stories of those who were wrongfully convicted and entitled to compensation. I'll also be directing you on ways that you can help. I'll be doing this in the hopes that together we can put pressure on the state to finally give those who were wrongfully convicted the compensation that they deserve.